Hello and welcome again to the programme where you can help police solve serious crimes from all over the country. We're live as usual with 40 phone lines standing by and the detectives investigating tonight's cases are here waiting for your call. The number as always is 01 811 8055. We hope this next 40 minutes is going to be as effective as the programme last month. We'll give you news about that later. Tonight, the sad story of Cathy Walsh, a grandmother from Tooting in South London, who was killed for no apparent motive. We video of a shoplifter who, with a trolley full of booty, simply barged her way out of a Sainsbury's store. And we've reconstructed an astonishing city centre hold-up in Oxford, in which armed raiders held up a security van and even a police car. But first, we've news of a major development in a key case that we featured in December. Linda Hunter from Carnoustie near Dundee disappeared in August. Her car was found in Manchester the following day, though several items were missing, including one of the wheels. Last Thursday, Linda's body was discovered in Ladybank Woods. That's about 30 miles south of Carnoustie, close to the main A914 Dundee to Kirkcuddy Road, a couple of miles from her parents' home in Glenrothes. So sadly, as police feared it would, this missing person case has now become a murder investigation. And there's been a further development, one which maybe you can help with. Someone saw a wheel with a Michelin tire, very much like the one missing from Linda's car. It was lying by the side of that main road, the A914. But six hours after the witness saw it, it was gone. Now, there's no crime in that. If you recovered that wheel, or if you spotted it there, or if you saw Linda in the area on Friday, August the 21st, please call us right now. Or call Fife Police on 0592, that's the code for Glenrothes, 52611. Our first case tonight is the murder of Cathy Walsh. Cathy was 60 years old, a rather sad woman in some ways, and yet no one has yet provided any clue or reason as to why she should have been murdered. In 1986, she'd been thrilled to become a grandmother when her daughter, Pat, gave birth to little Amy. The child became Cathy's pride and joy, and there were few other joys in her life. She'd been quite ill in the past few months. She had severe arthritis, and only three weeks before she died, she'd been in hospital with a heart condition. Our reconstruction begins on the day before she died, October the 20th, in Tooting in South London. Cathy had lived in this street for over 30 years. Life wasn't easy for her. <coughs> for two months, her gas supply had been cut off and she was always short of money. She was well known in the area as she had a habit of asking favors of some of the local shopkeepers and this garage a few yards away from her home. Here she comes again, Vic. I bet she wants to use the phone. <laughs> Yes. Today, shares take another tumble all over the world. In the wake of last week's hurricane, the cowboys start moving. Kathy's daughter, Pat, lived a few miles away in South Croydon. Over who speaks what? Once again this morning, shares have nosedived on the London stock market. Hello. Hello, Pat, love. Hello, Mum. Why haven't you phoned? Haven't you been well? She usually phoned her daughter every day. Look, why don't you come over tomorrow for a nice bath while your gas is off? Well, I suppose it would do my back good. Well, ring me before you come and I'll make sure I don't go out. All right, dear. See you in the morning. Bye, then. Pat was very close to her mother, but there were still some things she didn't know about her. Opposite Tooting Station on Mitcham Road is the Railway Bell Pub. Cathy used to come here regularly, usually on her own. But staff at the Railway Bell say she met a young man there several times until about two weeks before her death. And another woman who knew Cathy believes she may have seen them together one more time. Okay. Right. Mrs. Robichaud overheard Cathy arranging to meet him the next day. No one knows who this young man is, and police are anxious to trace him. The next day, Cathy had been in a lot of pain and had spent much of Tuesday in bed. I'm back. 
She'd sent her lodger, mm -hmm. Rudy, out for some shopping. Here's your vodka and cigarettes. Don't forget to put the latch down tonight. No, I won't. Rudy works night shifts and was out all that night. Bye, See you in the morning. 82, 82. 7 one, But despite her illness, she was seen later that evening at the Granada Bingo on Mitcham Road. She went several times a week and would usually sit by herself. Later, Cathy was seen sitting opposite a woman. Although they didn't appear to be together, police still need to trace her. Two and six, twenty-six. How are you tonight, Cathy? Not too bad. Yeah. See, you yeah, see you later. A friend of Cathy's remembers she seemed unhappy that night. Later, she was seen in the foyer, and she seemed to be waiting. About ten minutes later, two women saw someone who looked like Cathy boarding the number 44 bus. Yeah. Yeah. Cathy was in the habit of not paying her fare. She seemed flustered and upset. They remember her getting out her pension books. It's my address. All right. She got off the bus on the corner of Gorringe Park Avenue near her home. And that was the last time anyone saw her alive. Mrs. Johnson lives several doors away from Kathy's house. Much later that night, she'd been finding it difficult to sleep. The screams went on for several minutes. They seemed to come from the direction of Cathy's house. Just around the corner from Cathy's house, the milkman remembers seeing a brown Datsun parked across the pavement. There was someone in the passenger seat. At about the same time, a paper boy who passed Cathy's house remembers seeing the curtains open and her bedroom light on, but there was nobody in the room. Later that morning, when her body was found, the curtains were drawn and the light was off. Cathy had been strangled and left in her bed. Well, Mr Gibb Gray, do you think she knew whoever it was who killed her? Yes, I think it's very likely that she did know who killed her. When we got to the house, there was no sign that anyone had entered forcibly. No windows had been broken. And the door, in fact, was intact. And there seemed to be no motive at all? It's she... a brutal and mur motiveless murder. She didn't have any money, so... She didn't have any money. No, that's right. And we can't think of any reason why anyone should want to kill her. Mm. She was a harmless old lady. How certain are you that it was Cathy on the 44 bus that night? Well, we have two people who say they saw her, and they're fairly certain that they saw her. What we'd like to do is hear from the bus driver who drove that number 42 on that particular evening. We'd also like to hear of anyone else who's on that bus who may well have seen Cathy. And the questions I would ask there is, was she alone? And when she got off the bus, did she turn left or right? Did she go home or did she go back towards Tooting and maybe to a public house and meet somebody there? Right. Just to assure the bus driver who must have received that envelope but that he, he won't, he'll come forward in confidence, won't yes, he? Yes, he may well have committed some minor disciplinary offence against the London Transport Board but uh, what we're investigating here is a very serious case of murder. It's odd that Cathy didn't pay her fare because in fact she had a bus pass anyway, didn't she? That's strange and we really can't account for that and that may well account for her rather odd behaviour on, on the bus. Or, it, or, of course, she may well have been anticipating meeting someone later that evening and may have been slightly worried or concerned about right. it. Now the bus pass went missing. The other thing that went missing was one of her pension books. This, in fact, is not a pension book, it's a mobility allowance book. And this, this is a replica of what has gone missing. Do you think whoever killed her is the one who stole it? It's possible. We don't know that it, it's been stolen. It hasn't been cashed since that time. It's worth about £88 a month. 
This one has a unique feature on it. It's Aken, A-K-E-N, corner, rather than Amen corner, that part of Tooting where Cathy would have cached it. So that makes it quite distinctive. So we'd like to hear from anyone who's seen it since that time. Right. Now, that young man, maybe she was going to meet him later that evening and maybe that's why she was flustered. You want him to come forward? Yes, we'd like him to come forward. Again, he's, he's got something important to tell, her, tell us. He saw her on that Monday afternoon and firm arrangements appear to have been made for him to meet her on the Tuesday. We'd like him to come forward so we can eliminate him from the investigation. And perhaps anybody who's been drinking at the Railway Bell in the, in the past might recognise him too. That's right. The other important thing is the photograph. The one thing you couldn't trace or identify in her flat was who the person is in this particular photograph. Yes, that's very interesting because all her friends and indeed her family have looked at that photograph and they don't know the person. We would like the person whose photograph that is to come forward. It's probable that the photograph was taken in a public house or maybe a hotel in the London area or the south of England. We'd like to eliminate that person from this investigation. Right. And finally, at 7 o'clock on the morning of her death, the paper boy saw the light on and then later the light was off again and we saw a brown Datsun waiting on the corner of Bruce Road, perhaps waiting for somebody to come out of the house. Do you think there's a link there? Well, that's very significant because the owner of that car clearly has something important to say because if the paper boy is right it means that at that particular time there was somebody still in the house and he may well have left at the same time as the person who owned that car or indeed of course drove that car was there so we would of course like to hear from him. All right, Mr Gibgray, thank you very much. There are a lot of points there. As always, the number to the studio here is 01811 if you can help, or you can call the incident room at Mitcham direct, and that is 01541 2552. That's 01541 2552. We'll bring you any developments as they arise tonight and uh, I should tell you that last month's crime watch has already led to a number of arrests and it's thrown up several important leads which police are still pursuing. You may recall those dramatic pictures taken by remote cameras at Gartry Prison as a hijacked helicopter landed on the sports field and whisked away two prisoners. Well, one of our viewers helped confirm an existing line of inquiry and John Kendall, one of the escapees, was subsequently recaptured. Another man is also in custody awaiting trial on 26 offences, including abducting a man and hijacking a helicopter. But Sidney Draper is still at large. Please call us if you've seen him. And we showed a robbery in progress at a Leeds Permanent Building Society office in East London. A man featured in a series of pictures taken by a security camera was seen leaving with over £2,000 in cash. Well, four calls in particular seemed promising, but then, within an hour of the programme, a man walked into Barking Police Station and he has now been charged with the offence. You may recall the post office raid in Salisbury. That was the gang who got away with a quarter of a million pounds using specialised equipment to drill their way into the sorting office. Well, detectives had what they call a very good amount of information, including a call from someone who recognised that spanner with CAS, or was it C-A-Z, written on it. We'll keep you informed of progress in that case. The most disappointing result from last month was on the fire at Northampton. Three people, including a seven-year-old girl, died in the fire. The police are still hoping to speak again to a man who called the studio to say he'd been in the neighbourhood at the time. The man was anxious not to be identified and the police have asked us to assure him that his identity will be kept absolutely confidential. He, can, he might, without knowing it, hold the key to the murder of these three people. The number here to call again is 01811 Two other cases we featured have resulted in arrests, although not as a direct result of our programme. Near Honiton in Devon, a local youth has been charged with the murder of Ivy Batten. That was the 84-year-old lady who lived beside the railway line at Shute Bottom. And Andrew Longmire has been charged with a number of violent offences, including assault and possessing firearms. John Bly turned up trumps again last month. Several people recognised their possessions on the screen. The Arthurly Casket, a football trophy, was recognised by lots of people, including a friend of the owner from whose family the heirloom had been stolen. And two vases were recognised and traced to a major burglary in Langley in Berkshire, for which a man is now awaiting trial. And Flo Keane recognised the bracelet with the keys on it, which spelt out her name. Well, now to Incident Desk, and this month, the clues that could help solve a double murder in Birmingham. The pensioners in London who were conned out of their pension books on the promise of some free food, 
and the lorry which could help identify the murderer wanted in Essex. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. On the 22nd of December, the Tuesday evening just before Christmas, two elderly sisters were murdered in the Spark Hill area of Birmingham. Edna and Alice Rowley ran an old-fashioned corner shop on Greswold Road, Spark Hill. They'd worked there for over 50 years and lived in the house next door. This video was taken by scene of crime police officers the night the sisters were discovered and it reveals a number of clues left by their killer. In the sitting room where Alice was found, the table was laid for an evening meal, but the food was untouched. In the kitchen, a full pot of tea was waiting to be carried in. In the front room was discarded wrapping paper. The sisters' Christmas presents must have been taken by the intruder. At the foot of the stairs was an empty crisp packet, also a label torn from a suitcase which we believe was taken. Upstairs in the bedroom where Edna was found, a pile of clothes may have been tipped out of that suitcase. In the shop, the stock was left untouched but the old wooden till drawer had been pulled out and emptied. But the door to the shop was still locked and bolted, so the intruder most probably came in by another entrance. The night the sisters died, a neighbour remembers seeing a man standing in the porch at the front door to their house around 7.30pm. He was in his late 40s with grey collar-length hair and wearing a well-worn green or brown jacket. Do you recognise him? These items are identical to the presents that were unwrapped and taken from the sister's house. This radio cassette player is a Toshiba. There was a bottle of Tia Maria and these toiletries were also taken. And that suitcase label came from one like this. Notice the lining. Someone must have seen it. And the last clue, the crisp packet left behind by the intruder. It wasn't a brand sold by the sisters. Perhaps someone sold them to this man. Ring us if you know him or can help in any way. Next, we need your help to trace a lorry which could help, help solve the murder of an 18-year-old girl from Colchester in Essex. Fiona Gallant was last seen alive at about 6.30pm on Thursday the 17th of December last year. Several people say they saw her giving directions to a lorry driver near her home in Lexton on the west side of Colchester. The next day, Fiona's body was found two miles further west, beside a lay-by on the London-bound carriageway of the A12 road. She had been asphyxiated. Despite far-reaching inquiries, that lorry has not been traced, and the driver has yet to come forward. Fifteen witnesses saw the lorry, and what they agreed on has helped us to create this drawing. It was certainly a flatbed vehicle, and was probably not articulated. It had a single rear axle. There were two stacked loads on the rear, the taller at the back, and they were covered in a tarpaulin. Some witnesses described the lorry as light blue, others as dark blue, perhaps more like this. The wing mirrors may have been double, and it may have had indicators on stalks. A child who saw the lorry remembers the letters Tosh on the front of the cab, but they may have been scrubbed out or painted over by now. Several witnesses recall seeing a round emblem on the grill. That may have been any one of these badges, or of course it might have been a hubcap. We desperately want to trace that lorry's whereabouts, so if you've seen it, or know where it is, call us now. We're looking for a couple who made off with over 40 pension books in an extraordinary hoax in East London. This handout offering free food to pensioners was given away on the 3rd of February by a woman standing outside the Roman Road post office in the East End, and near this Tesco's on Bethnal Green Road. The next day, 44 pensioners turned up at this church hall. Eggs, cheese, butter, orange squash, tea, sugar and bread rolls were laid out for them. A man at the hall collected their pension books, saying they had to be stamped, and he promptly disappeared. He's in his 40s, 5 foot 8 inches tall and heavily built, with ginger greased back hair. We don't know much about the woman who gave out the pamphlets. She's about 20, 5 foot 3 inches tall, with mousy collar length hair. If the pension books are cashed, the couple could get away with several thousand pounds. And please remember, if you have a pension book, don't give it to anyone or let it out of your sight. And do please call us if you can help. In the early hours of December the 29th, Barry St Germain was murdered at his home in Notting Hill. Barry was last seen alive on the bank holiday Monday after Christmas. He was at, a, at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in St Columbus Church, Chelsea. But no one has come forward yet who remembered whether he arrived with or left with anyone. Barry was a distinctive looking man, aged 34, 6 foot 2 inches tall with dyed blonde hair. 
That night he was wearing a black fedora hat and a long black trench coat. We particularly want to speak to anyone who saw Barry between St Columba's Church and his home in Pembridge Gardens, Notting Hill. He normally travelled by tube, but he could have stopped off somewhere. Barry is a homosexual and we believe his killer was also gay. There were no signs of a break-in at his flat, so the killer may well have been someone Barry knew. So if you remember seeing Barry that Monday night, or can help in any way, do please ring us. Your call will be dealt with in complete confidence. Lastly, take a look at these. They're what remains of an impressive collection that was stolen from a home in the village of Stock in Essex. The owner, Jim Strachan, kept them in this summer house. But sometime between the 6th and 8th of January it was broken into, and over 2,000 figures were taken. One of the interesting things that you'll notice about these figures that were stolen is that quite a number of them stepped off with the right foot as against the left foot, which is a normal thing for them to do. Many of them have this identification painted on, on, on the base of them. Uh, they're all lead figures. Most of them are hollow cast. Uh, they were taken away in a cabin trunk. We would not needed two people, maybe three, to have taken this because of the, the weight uh, involved. Well, whoever took them almost certainly knew what they were looking for because they selected the most valuable and unique examples. It's possible they're being offered for sale somewhere. So if you've seen them, Call us now. There's a substantial reward. And the number to ring is 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Now think back, if you can, to a Monday morning three weeks before Christmas, nine o'clock in the morning of Monday, December the 7th. In the university city of Oxford, Christmas shopping was getting underway, and two men, armed with a shotgun, were sitting in wait, about to terrorise the town centre. This was to be Oxford's first armed raid on a security van and, as you're about to see, several people had a go to try and stop it. Indeed, the raid was foiled, but the gunman got away. Thames Valley Police now need your help to try to trace them. Our reconstruction starts near Balliol College in Oxford's Broad Street. This is Erica Barnes with the Radio Oxford News on Monday the 7th of December. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev will land at Bryce Norton Airfield in Oxfordshire later this morning for an historic meeting with Mrs Thatcher. At about 9 o'clock, this secretarial student, Amanda McKenzie, arrived at her college in George Street. At the same time, a white Ford Escort van pulled in opposite the co-op. The second man stayed sitting inside the van. The workman on the pavement was noticed by a woman who had to squeeze past him. She remembers he was short and had dark, greasy hair. At exactly nine o'clock, a Securicor van drew up outside the co-op. A solicitor relayed news of the hold-up to the police. Outside Three Ways House. George Street. George Street. Hey, back! Down! Down! They used an unusual Black Hawk hydraulic jack to try to get into the vault. No! Meanwhile, unseen by the robbers, this man, a local shopkeeper, Henry Dean, tried to prevent the raiders' getaway. The men both wore trainers. 
and the gunman carried a pump-action shotgun. Come on! He's got a gun, Pete. The police had little option but to obey the gunman. While the raider tried to lever open the door from the outside, inside a Securicor guard hammered the tools back out. They gave up. Where's the case? In the van. Come on, we'll use this. Come on. The other man had found something to break the ignition lock. This driver tried to block their way. And a guard threw an iron bar at the raiders. But the gunman seemed strangely cool. They drove up Gloucester Street and crossed Bowman Street. Going up St John Street, the gunman tried to shut the back doors, but nearly fell out himself. They turned out of Pusey Street into St Giles and headed north up Banbury Road. Finally, they turned off the Woodstock Road into Russell Court. Where did they go after this? The van had been stolen a month previously from the Cowley area, but where had it been for that month? And police have been unable to trace where these items came from, these large canvas bags with a nautical logo on them, and the jack, which is normally used in car body repair shops or as fire rescue equipment. Robberies always look much easier in the movies, don't they? In fact, this was no laughing matter. Uh, a couple remarkably like these two tried a similar robbery in Swindon back in September, and there they fired shots all over the place. The man trying to find them is Detective Inspector David Belcher. They do seem a couple of bunglers, though, it must be said. Mr Ross, these two men are highly dangerous, discharging a, a shotgun in a busy city centre. We were extremely fortunate that nobody was injured. You must have pretty good descriptions of them. Over 100 people saw them. Yes, we'd also like some more people to come forward as well that saw the robbers before the robbery took place in George Street. There were a couple of police officers, of course, uh, among those who were there. What descriptions have you got of the man? Well, the man with the uh, yellow jacket holding the pump-action shotgun is described as 25 years old, 5 foot 9 tall. He's slim build. He has tidy brown short hair blue eyes and he's clean shaven. Very distinctive eyes too by the looks of that video. Yes, indeed. What about his accomplice? Well he's the man inside the security court vehicle. He's described as about five foot six, five foot eight. He's stockier than his accomplice and he's much older, 25 to 30. 
Now, their white van, in fact, someone, the guy who tried to steal the keys from it has become something of a local celebrity, I gather. Where did, where did the robbers get that white Ford Escort van from? That was stolen from the Cowley area, Little Hay Road, on the 8th of November, uh, a month before the robbery. Right, and it's got two sets of plates there. The uh, original ones, I gather, are the ones at the bottom, the false ones at the top. That is correct. Where did those false plates come from? They were made at uh, Partco in Windmill Road in Croydon, south-east London. And we don't know when, of course. It was sometime after, perhaps after the vehicle was stolen. So it is quite conceivable this wasn't a local job at all. These people could have come from anywhere. Indeed, they could. The, the motorways connect, obviously, Oxford to, to London. They could easily have come from the London area. Now, this Black Hawk Porter Power Jack, and it operates by, if you pump that handle, then these jaws are supposed to prise open, and it leaks, this particular one, which is quite distinctive. Where did this one come from, do you know? Well, that is the question which we'd very much like to answer tonight. It's new condition. It, um, it's probably been stolen from a garage or from a vehicle, or indeed it may even been purchased by the gunmen themselves. Right. Very dangerous people, as you say. There's a reward, I gather. Yes, quite a substantial reward offered by Securicorp. Well, it may well be someone in the underworld is prepared to shop these particular rather reckless people. If you can help, here's the number, 01811 8055. 01811 8055. If you saw the robbery or know anything, there's the Oxford number. Call the incident room direct, 0865, the code for Oxford, 249881. That's 0865 249881. Well, since we've been on the air, we've had quite a lot of calls on the cases we've covered already. We've had one possible lead on the murder of Linda Hunter, and it's a clue on the missing wheel and tyre from her car. A garage owner has called in to say that somebody tried to sell him a tyre just like the one described, so we're going to be following that one up. And on the murder of Cathy Walsh, we've had a lot of calls from people during the evening from people who saw her on the night that she died. And police are busy evaluating those. And they would particularly like to hear from somebody who phoned in some distress. Please do call again. It is in confidence. It's 01 811 8055. One of the most shocking crimes we've ever covered on Crime Watch has finally been resolved. It was a raid on a gun shop in Leicestershire in which the owner was doused in petrol and set alight. Well, as a result of information from Crime Watch viewers, the men responsible have now been convicted for the crime. At Leicester Crown Court, two men were given 14 and 12 years, respectively, for attempted murder and robbery. Another one was sentenced to nine years youth custody, and a fourth was given three years for conspiracy. You may remember a reconstruction just over a year ago in which one of the gang robbing a security van dressed as a school's crossing assistant, complete with white Mac and lollipop sign. Well, that raid was in Hyde near Manchester and watching the reconstruction in another suburb of the city was a woman who was just about to head out for the evening when she thought she saw something familiar. That's my lollipop, she said. It had gone missing from outside a pub in Woodley and her information in fact helped police with a new line of inquiry that they were already following. Four men and a woman have now been charged with conspiracy to commit a series of armed robberies involving over a quarter of a million pounds. And at around the same time as that case, we reconstructed a case in Northampton in which elderly people were attacked in their homes. A viewer called the programme with information which now, over a year later, has led to the arrest of one man. Police are looking for some others and we'll let you know what happens. There's been a crucial development on a case we reconstructed two years ago. Barry Lewis vanished while playing near his home in Walworth in South London. The next day, a driver gave a lift to a man who was carrying a small boy and he said that his own car had run out of petrol. The driver dropped the man and boy beside a red car. It was probably a Talbot Horizon. Well, the police checked 9,500 red horizons, but it got them nowhere. Then, ten weeks ago, an anonymous caller told police to look in a garage under some flats at Witchwood House in the Canterbury Gardens estate in Brixton in South London, and they found a red Talbot Horizon. Detectives on the case have asked us to appeal to that caller Please ring again. The police guarantee it will be in confidence. It, whoever made that call, though, presumably knows more. And let's face it, other children's lives might be at stake. The number 01 811 8055. Well, finally tonight, the Crime Watch photo call. Four faces of people police would like to speak to and whom you might recognise. Here again are David Hatcher and Helen Phelps. Can you help us identify this man seen here last May in the Nationwide Building Society in Forest Gate, East London? He threatened staff with a handgun carried in a white plastic bag. 
But as there wasn't any money in the cash drawers, he left empty-handed. Here he is a month earlier, just one mile away in the Woolwich Building Society, Upton Park, London. Again he carried a handgun, and this time he got away with several hundred pounds after threatening another customer. On both occasions he handed over those in these notes demanding money. Take a closer look at those pictures. Sooner or later he may act on those notes, so we need to catch him now. If you recognise him, ring us. This is a British visitor's passport photocopied in November by a bank in Paris. The passport is now known to be forged and the man in the picture is part of an international gang using stolen cheques to transfer money from London to Europe. This may be a better likeness of him. Don't know any more about his description except that he's aged about 30 and perhaps the glasses are a disguise. He used the name William J. Kelly and gave a false address on the Harrow Road, North London. The bank in Paris was defrauded of nearly half a million French francs. Call us if you can identify him. Next, do you recognise this woman? On the 25th of November last year, she rushed past the cash desks at a home base store in Catford, South London. The trolley was stacked with what we believe were hundreds of pounds worth of electrical goods. She loaded them into a red Renault 16, registration number TPF 554W. It may have been driven away by an accomplice. Look at her again. She's 25, 5 foot 10, slim, with mousy brown hair. If you've seen her or that car, call us now. Finally, an armed robber who raided four London building societies just before Christmas. Here he is in the Leeds Permanent Building Society in Richmond, Surrey, on November the 18th. He threatened staff with a handgun and made off with several thousand pounds. We believe he may have made his getaway on the tube. Perhaps you saw him. Take a good look at him. He's six feet tall and aged about 30. He was wearing a dark jacket, blue jeans and trainers. Give us a call if you recognise him or if you think you've seen any of the four faces on our photo call tonight. There's the number 01811 That's 01811 We're just getting some uh, information in calls so far. Fifteen possible witnesses apparently to the lorry in the Fiona Gallant murder who think that they can identify it. And callers may have found at least part of the collection of toy soldiers that were stolen in Essex. Apparently some of them have turned up in North London in pawn shops. Obviously we'll have more information in Crime Watch Update. If you've been finding it difficult to get through, do keep trying if the lines are busy. You'll find a list of local police numbers on CFAX on page 186, or of course you can always write to us, and our address is Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. We will be back in an hour and a half, as I say, with Crime Watch Update, and we'll have more news still on open air tomorrow. But if you're heading off for bed soon, uh, you might bear in mind that the latest crime figures actually show a net overall decrease in crime in the London area. And there are other indications that several crimes, and especially burglary, may be declining throughout the country. And it seems that the uh, calls from viewers behind me are helping to accelerate that process. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <coughs>